Uh, well, this morning I have a treat for you. Well, I hope you'll think it's a treat. Um, I'm taking you back to school. Um, you remember when you sat in the hall uh, in those desks all lined up and uh, they put pieces of paper in front of you and gave you a question paper? Examination time, that's what it is. That's a treat. Um, I've got a question for you. Uh, there's only one question on the paper. Um, I mean, I don't mean you literally to write it down, but I would be interested to know what you're thinking. The question is this. I'm thinking of a phrase that is in common use among us. Uh, we talk about being saved. Preachers preach about being saved. Hymn books uh, are always on about this being saved. And my question is, if you were asked in an examination paper, what would you write down? What does being saved mean to you? How, what do you understand by I'm saved? Um, when the preacher calls you to be saved or whatever, and the hymn starts singing about being saved. I wonder what you would write down. Now here I might be going wildly wrong. Um, but I'm not alone um, when I say that I fear, I think that's a good word, I fear that a growing number of believers would write down something which is at best weak and at worst is actually wrong. I might be wrong in saying that, but I'm not alone in saying it or thinking it. In fact, I feel it very strongly. And working on that assumption, I want to answer that question myself. And uh, I'm hoping you're listening, so it might be helpful to you. It might confirm you in what you answered, or it might make you think, yes, there's more in this than I realized. What does it mean, being saved? Right. Now, I suspect, I'm trying to be cautious, I suspect that uh, the answer for many people, a growing number of people, might run, I mean, uh, might run along the lines like this. I know I'm a sinner, and I trust Jesus, and uh, I'm forgiven my sins. Being saved, I suspect, to a great many people, a growing number of people, believers, amounts to being saved, uh, being forgiven for sins. They might go on to say, uh, and when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven when I die. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of that in funeral services. Uh, there's plenty of that in funeral hymns, resurrection uh, hymns about uh, the future. So I, I put it to you that being saved um, means having your sins forgiven, being at peace with God, you might even use the word if you, although I'm doubtful about many people today, but you might use the word justified. I'm justified. Good Bible word, justification. And I'm going to heaven when I die. You might add words like 
uh, preachers have told you, once saved, always saved. Indeed, if you know John Kent's hymn, you will know once in him, in him forever. Okay? And you might say, you might use the phrase eternal security. Once saved, always saved. Anyway, I, uh, as I say, I suspect that's the kind of answer. There's a lot of truth in quite a bit of that. I don't go all the way with all of it by any means, but being convicted of sin, trusting Christ, being washed in his precious blood, being justified, yes, I'm, that's bang on. But I, this is the point I want to make. There is something very seriously lacking in that answer. You see, I think for a growing number of believers, to be forgiven for sins is the end of the journey. In fact, I'm pretty convinced that it's not even as good as that. I'll come to that later on. But let's just take this point, that if you can get somebody to trust Jesus and know their sins are forgiven, you're home and dry. That's the finish. Oh, heaven when you die, of course. But the real thing is, they are justified. Now, I wrote a book once on justification, and um, I stressed how important it was. It is vitally important. Uh, I probably quoted Martin Luther when he said that the doctrine of justification by faith, grace alone, and so on, without works, is the standing mark of a uh, of the gospel and of the churches, you know. If you're not preaching justification by faith, something's drastically wrong. I can understand why he said that with his experience as a Roman Catholic friar. But today, I would add an extra note to that book, and that's what I'm doing this morning. Now, I have a text for you, but before I come to my text, I want to give you two passages to prepare the ground. I was thinking November coming soon, this next week, uh, back in my youth when I was a keen gardener, November and December were months when I was out in the garden with my fork, cleaning the ground and turning it over, preparing the ground for the winter, laying it up for the frost and the snow and the rain to bash it to pieces and make it friable in the spring. I didn't have any trouble because I was on sandy soil, but if you had clay, that was essential, and I would like to get the digging done before Christmas preparation. Well, I've got two texts for you, two passages for you, by way of preparation. Let's hear what the Word of God says about this being saved. Right. My first passage is in Romans chapter 8, and it's an extremely well-known passage. Romans chapter 8, and it's verse 28, uh, 29, and 30. Remember my question, what is it to be saved? What does it mean? And I'm questioning those people who stop at justification, right? This is what we read in Romans 8, 28. We know, says Paul, that all things work together for good, uh, work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also 
glorified. Now just look at that passage and I'll just underline the point I want to make. You'll notice that justification is in there. Well, I've said that's vital. I, I'm, not, I'm not detracting from that at all. All I'm saying to you that justification is not the terminus. It's not where we get off the train. It's not the end station. It's not where we end up. We're not home and dry when it's justification. Justification is there. It's in the passage. Yes. Also, glorified is in the passage. The very end. And I think the glorification there that he's talking about, you'll have to read the context yourself, is the new heavens and the new earth. When Christ comes again, glory, 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 the everlasting kingdom. And we're going to be glorified. That's what Paul says. We're going to be made like unto him. We shall see him as he is, and we shall have a renewed body. This poor mortal body will be transformed into the likeness to Christ. That's their glorification. Okay. But did you notice this? It's verse 29 in the middle of it. What does it mean to be saved? Well, we are foreknown, that's loved by God, verse 29. Pre-loved by God in eternity. Predestinated, yes, God's will and purpose. Now here we come to it. What do you understand, Paul, by being saved? That God might take these poor, wretched sinners who are lost in Adam. He said all that in chapter 5. Christ has died for them. He said that in Romans 3. He said they're under the wrath of God, but God in his mercy has sent Christ to die for them. That's Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4. Faith. That's all in the early chapters of Romans. And this is what he says. Well, why did God save these people? What does being saved mean? That they might be conformed, that they might be conformed to the image of his Son. What does being saved mean? Justified? Well, yes. Glorified? Yes. But the real purpose, the real purpose is that God take, might take people like us and make us like Christ. This is a staggering point, but this is what he says here. He says he's taking these poor wretched sinners, Romans chapter 1, who are lost in Adam, dead in sins, under the wrath of God. Christ has died for them. The blood of Christ has washed them. They're now in Christ, but God's purpose is not simply to rescue them from their sins, but to make them to be conformed, to be like the image, the likeness of Christ. And this glory, you see, is when Christ comes again, all his people will be like him. Now, I'm lost here, but in that day, Christ will come and he will be king, firstborn above all these people like him. You're going to be part of that if you're a believer. Yes, you're justified. I don't deny it. Yes, you're forgiven your sins. But there's a bigger picture. God is making you and going to make you, and this is what he planned in eternity past, to make you like Jesus. I can't explain it. I'm lost. Like Newton said, I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. I, I can't explain it. But there it is. That's what he says. Being saved? Yeah, I'm justified. Yep. I'm forgiven. Once saved, always saved. No. Once saved, conformed to Christ. Made like him. That's my first text. However is he going to do that? Well, I could spend a long time on answering that, but I'll just give you a quick answer by way of preparation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is only a brief preparation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading verses 17 and 18. Again, I'm not dealing with the context here. What Some of the things he says here, 
depend on the things that he's just said earlier in the chapter. You'll have to read that for yourself. But my main point comes over very easily. The question now is, God is saving me so that he can make me, yeah, me, and you, if you're a believer, yeah, you, make you like Jesus in his sight. <laughs> How is he going to do it? Well, let's read 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. He introduces it. Now the Lord is that spirit. He's bringing in the spirit of God. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Okay, I'm not dealing with that. But he's got the context. He's got the spirit of God coming. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. That depends on what he's just been saying. I don't need that at the moment. Here we are, are changed. Now that's bad. It should be our being changed. That's the proper rendering of that. We are being changed. God has saved you, brother. God has saved you, sister. And you know what he's doing? Day by day, hour by hour, he's changing you by his spirit into the same image. You see the point? You're being transformed. You're being changed. You're being conformed to Christ. That is going on even as I'm talking to you now. Even as I prepared for this and I began to see this opening up to me, God was doing it. And as you're listening to it, God is still doing it for you and to me. I could talk about suffering. I could talk about mutual conversation. I could go give many reasons from Scripture. But the point is, by the Spirit of God, being saved by the Spirit of God means being changed. He took me in Adam, in the flesh, dead in sins, and he brought me into Christ by regeneration and faith, and he brought me to Christ to save me, to wash me from my sins. And now, from now on, for the next 50, 60, 70, 80 years, whatever it is, he's transforming me into the likeness of Christ. We're changed from the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You wouldn't believe it if you weren't in the Bible. You think it was being made up. It's a fairy story. God takes you, yeah, little you. He sent his son to die for you. He sent his spirit to work in you and live in you. He planned all this in eternity so that you could be happy forever. No, so that you could be like Christ forever. It's, it's mind-blowing, isn't it? Staggering, isn't it? But that's what he's saying. Now I come to my text. <laughs> and my text is the passage I read to you. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Here's the answer you should have put on that question paper. What does it mean to be saved? And here is the answer. Verse 4 of Ephesians 1. God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Why? Why has he done that? That he might save you. Yes, okay. What do you mean, Paul? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What do you mean by that? You could translate that. Not literally translate, but you could use the words, holy and without blame before him in love, like Christ. That's what he's saying there. Let me make a very big point here. There are people who will say to you, uh, what he means there is, he should wash you from your sins, that you might be justified, that your sins might be forgiven. Well, that's in the passage. It certainly is. You can read the whole passage. But that's not what he's saying at all. That you might be holy, that we might be holy and without blame before him in love, is nothing to do with our justification. 
we are in the sight of God without condemnation by justification. I agree. But that is not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? Then I need you to go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. This is very important. When he says that you might be holy and without blame before him in love, he's not talking about you must be right with God. That is true. But actually what he's talking about is what this writer is also talking about in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Well, verse 13, sorry, I'll read from verse 13. Well, I'll read from verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Now, here we come, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Go back to Ephesians 1 in your mind. Why did God choose me? Why did Christ die for me? Why did the Spirit come into me? That I might be made holy and without blame before him in love. And what he's saying here in, verse, uh, in Hebrews 12 is this. I, I, I've had it said to me by a strict Baptist man, uh, well, what, Paul, what, what the writer means there is that we should be justified. No, no, this is not justification. Look at the context. Follow peace with all men, looking diligently, striving this. Don't do this. It's all about works, my friend. It's all about practical holiness. It's not about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's true. I don't deny it. But this is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are justified. You go on then in holiness. And without that holiness, you will never see the Lord. Well, I don't believe that, don't you? Then you shouldn't have sang Mr. Brown's hymn. Shall I remind you of the hymn you sang just now? If I can find it again. We sang this hymn together. This is what we sang. This man, Mr. Brown, I don't know this man. He lived um, in the 16 and 1700s, but this is how he wrote. Lead us to holiness, the road that we must take this is what you sang, that we must take to dwell with God. Simon Brown, lead us to holiness, the road that we must take. Where did he get that from? Hebrews 12. That's what he's writing on. This man has got it. He sees that unless I'm holy in my life, conformed to Christ, then I'm not justified. I'm not justified because I'm living right, but if I'm justified, I will live according to this conformity to Christ. Probably failing to get the point over. I'm not preaching salvation by works. By trusting Christ, we are justified. But once we trust Christ, once in him, I wouldn't say once in him and him forever. Now, once in him, you'll be conformed to Christ. You'll in Peter's words, grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. This is what he's teaching here. So my text then, in one sense, is Ephesians 1 and verse 4. But I've got another text for you, and it's Ephesians 1 and the whole book. Wow. Yes. There's a group I've been associated with, uh, and uh, we started to study Ephesians. Uh, but it went very wrong, very quickly. So I'm no longer part of that group. If I'd been leading the group, this is how I would have led it. The first thing I would say is, what is the letter to the Ephesians about? And what it is about is in verse 4, that we should be without, with, uh, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God has chosen us. Christ has died for us. This is what he's going to teach us so that we might be holy and without blame before him in love, conform to Christ. And I would say the rest of Ephesians is going to prove it. 
Let me prove it to you now, very briefly. I won't be a few minutes. Where does this man start? Well, he starts at the beginning. Where was the beginning? We are dead in sins. We start off in the beginning and we're absolutely dead in sins. Where did you get that? Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead. Oh. And what does he do with these dead sinners when he's quickened them, when he's regenerated them? Read the rest of Ephesians 2 and you'll see he brings them to Christ in faith. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's to finish now. No, it's not. No, Because Ephesians 2, that's 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, verse 10, you can follow for yourself, that God has given us these works which he has prepared beforehand for us to do. Once he saved you, you're on the road to working in holiness. Now, it didn't start with my regeneration. Paul didn't actually start there. Where did he start? Election. Way back in eternity with God's will. But my first experience is regeneration. Ephesians 2, 1 and on. Then it's trust in Christ. And from then on, it's obedience to Christ. Obedience to his law. It's conformity to his likeness. If you like, the first three chapters of Ephesians are telling us what we were and what we have become in Christ. Saved, in the sense of justified, brought into Jesus. And then, how does he start the last three chapters? This is how he starts chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the convocation wherewith you've been called. Now live it out, he said to these Ephesians. What's the letter to the Ephesians about? Live out this salvation which God has worked in. Philippians chapter 1. God has worked in us and we work it out. And if we don't, Hebrews 12, then we can do all the talking we like about being saved, but we haven't a clue what it means. Being saved is much more than just being justified. Don't misunderstand me when I say that, please. But being justified will lead on to being conformed to Christ. The rest of the Ephesians is all to do with that. I will just take one place to show it to you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20. He talks about learning Christ. You've been saved, right? If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Now listen to him, that you put off concerning the former conversation, put off your old way of life, what you were before you became a Christian, what you were in Adam, put it off. The old man, that means what you were in Christ, in Adam. That's what it is. You were in Adam. You were the old man. You were under the ruining wrath of God which is corrupt, and so on. And verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, Christ. Conform yourself to Christ by the spirit who is conforming you. So he speaks about the spirit doing it and he speaks about our responsibility to grow in grace. That's how Peter finishes his second letter, grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ in the context of the new heavens and the new earth. Which is created in, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now I confess that until very recently I have missed this. I'd seen the importance of justification. And I knew the importance of progressive sanctification, growing in grace. Yes, I'd seen that. But this massive thought that God from eternity past, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, 
If you heard me this morning, I've been talking about God the Father in his election, God the Son in dying, and God the Spirit in working in us. The triune God has from eternity past to eternity future been accomplishing his purpose, which is to take dead, wretched, ruined sinners and make them like Christ. Now I'll finish with just three simple applications. I confess I hadn't seen it. I see it now. I want the Spirit to conform me to Christ and I have my responsibility to walk in the ways of God and to grow like Christ. Well, what's the three applications? Well, I'll start, oddly enough, and address any unbeliever. And I do so because I think this is where I came in. This is where evangelicals are losing the plot. We're living in a time when increasingly people think the business we're engaged in is getting people to come to chapel. Get them to chapel. As long as we get them to chapel, we're virtually there. Especially if they can go through a course and learn the basics of Christianity uh, and sign up to it. They don't talk about the unconverted anymore. They call them the unchurched. Did you know that? They're reaching the unchurched. My friend, we're reaching the lost. Nothing to do with church. They're lost. And God didn't from eternity plan to make a people of chapel goers. He planned to make a race of men and women like Jesus. Very different. So I would say to any unbeliever, don't settle for chapel attendance. Don't settle for knowing the facts. Only settle for trusting Christ and being conformed to his image. If you settle for anything less, you're ruined. You can be a chapel goer, you can be a chapel preacher. If I may say so, you can be a chapel organist. Chapel flower ranger. Chapel cleaner. But what God wants is conformity to Jesus. And only God the Spirit can do that with blood-washed sinners. It takes God to do that. Uh, and I would add a writer there. If any, um, if any evangelical responsible is listening to me, um, get off that mad roundabout. Start preaching for regeneration. Unless you're born again, you will never see the kingdom. You can go to the chapel, but if you're not, unless you're born again, you will never see the kingdom. And once you're born again, you cry to Christ. And once you cry to Christ, you live in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit of God, being conformed to Jesus. Second application. I want to encourage you, believer. I know from what people tell me that the devil attacks. And he reminds you of how weak you are and how... Oh, and of course, he's got plenty of ground to work on. But if you grasp this point, can't you see, my friend, if you've ever trusted Jesus, however weakly, can you see you're in this great plan of God? And can the plan of God fail? If you think so, you better read Romans 9, 10, and 11 and see. What God has purposed always comes to pass. Read the book of Daniel. God's will is sovereign. Read the Second Timothy chapter 1. God has planned it from eternity and he's thinking of eternity future. He's taken you out of Adam and brought you into Jesus. Why? To perfect you, 
to be like his son. And once God has begun a good work in you, he will complete it, says Paul. He will perfect it. So I'm trying to encourage you. Say it to yourself. I'm actually in the plan of the triune God. Isn't that amazing? In eternity past, he, he thought about me. I've used Paul Baines before, uh, the Puritan. He said, God pitcheth upon persons. He pitches on persons. He doesn't just look at the mass and say, oh, yes. He looked at you. <laughs> you. And he said, you live. And you lived. And he's saying, you be conformed to Christ. And you are being conformed. And you will go into glory with him. I want to encourage you. But I also want to challenge you. That's the third point. It seems contradictory, but then the gospel is foolish, isn't it? Yeah. What's the contradiction? Yes, God will do it, but you must do it. Work out, for it's God who works in. Philippians chapter 1. He will conform you, but you must be conformed. Explain it. I can't. Not trying. All I know is, I rejoice in the assurance, and now I want to grow in grace. Lord, conform me to Christ. May this time together help me to be more like him. May this coming week, may I live it out more fully. So I don't believe in eternal security. I believe, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. What I believe is once God has converted you, you will continue to persevere until one day you will be completely transformed into his likeness. Well, I aimed high this morning and I've probably fallen very far short. But if it's got any glimmer of hope for you, any sense of the purpose of God in eternity past the future, of his regenerating power, his justifying grace, his sanctifying power, conform me to Christ. If there's any sense of that, and thus something to take home anyway. I'm only sorry that my words would have fallen short on it. But I tell you this, if you read your Bible with your eyes open to this, you will see it everywhere, especially when you read the post-Pentecost scriptures, Romans and on. Read those scriptures and you will see these apostles and the other men forever calling us as believers to show to, through our lives, to show the glory of God. Just one point, Peter, be ye holy. Why? Because I am holy. Be like Christ, you see. You can see it everywhere once you've seen it. I hope you never get it out of your mind. And I hope that some poor sinner may hear it. And instead of thinking, oh, I'm a churchianity man. No, my friend, Christ is what you need, not churchianity. The gospel is nothing about churchianity. It's all about Christ. We preach Christ Jesus, the Lord. Well, I hope God will bless his word to us then. Now, I want to close by singing, by, by um, reading a, a hymn to you. I've never sung it before. Um, uh, you, you probably have it in your hymn book. But I found it very difficult to find hymns on this theme. This is so weak a point in the evangelical world. I don't know of many hymns on it. But Vernon Hyam did write one. Let me read the verse to you. In verse 1, this is 131, uh, O glorious majesty. In verse 1, he, at the end, he puts the last two lines, In perfect blessed, blessedness we find, by faith thy glorious image bright. At least he's got the point in there, the image. But look at verse 3. Thy perfect plan for all thy known is born in every chosen heart. Forbid it then that we should roam or ever seek from thee to part. Now here he is, to thee predestined to conform and bear thine image in our lives with glorious gown and shining crown and all this from thy grace derives. I think Vernon Hyam has caught the spirit of this. The purpose of God is to conform us 
to Christ.